combat May 1st, 1945, we had a relief of 27th Army Division because they were suffering heavy, suffering heavy casualties. Um, we were under front lines for a couple months after that. So. Um, I was a, a loader in an M4 Sherman. Um, we would operate uh, with flamethrower tanks with, with the Army which uh, helped us a lot there. We had guys right down in front of us, enemy route right down in front of us, and uh, I started calling the shots, 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock, three of them, and he's bow gun, so we're gonna just spray in the area, and uh, we did that for about half hour. The next morning, everybody gets out and looks around. We could hear the rounds pinging off of our tank. We spent a lot of time at Conti Inn, and that was a bad place because those uh, North Vietnam knew exactly where the tanks were, and they would shell us all the time. And, and finally, I got to where I made my tankers sleep in the tanks. We didn't get out of them. At the time, we were running out of ammo. Uh, we shot, I shot more main gun ammunition in Fallujah than I fired in the entire invasion. And uh, we were running low on ammo, big time. And I remember just like arraying these pretty little six warheads, the six rounds inside the ready rack going, that's all I got. That's it. I got six, six main gun rounds. I've got a couple thousand rounds of 7.62. I've got a few hundred rounds of 50 cal. This is all I got to go fight in the city. Well, let's do it. I told Delta Company when we left that the thing I was most proud of was the number of people we didn't kill. And, and, I, and I wanted to say that deliberately to them. Uh, and I, I said, someday when you're telling your grandkids about this, remember that the thing your CEO was most proud of was the people you didn't kill. The sight, I can hear the tracks. I still remember this plane as day. I can hear the track box. As we're rolling through this obscuration, I just want to, you know, I want to tell the drivers punches when we get out of it. Because I want to see what, I want to see what happened. The first tank battalion was activated on November 1, 1941 at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina and was attached to the 1st Marine Division. 38 days later, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. After the outbreak of World War II, 1st Tank Battalion embarked on an extensive training program to prepare for combat operations. The Watchtower Force, numbering 75 warships and transports, assembled near Fiji on July 26 and engaged in one rehearsal landing prior to leaving for Guadalcanal. At 9.10 a.m. on the 7th of August, Major General Vandegrift and 11,000 U.S. Marines, including companies Abel and Baker of 1st Tank Battalion, came ashore on Guadalcanal between Coley Point and Lunga Point. Advancing towards Munda Point, they encountered little resistance 
and secured the airfield by 4 p.m. on the 8th of August. In response to the Allied landings on Guadalcanal, the Japanese sent their 17th Army, a corps-sized command, with the task of retaking Guadalcanal. Jacob Guza, a Coast Watcher scout, warned the Marines of the impending attack minutes before the Japanese assault, which was subsequently defeated. The 1st Battalion, 1st Marine Regiment, under Lieutenant Colonel Cresswell, crossed Alligator Creek upstream from the battle area, enveloped the enemy troops from the south and east, cut off any avenue for retreat, and began to compress the enemy into a small area in a coconut grove on the east bank of the creek. Aircraft from Henderson Field strafed Japanese soldiers who attempted to escape down the beach, and later in the afternoon, four or five M3 Stewart tanks swept the coconut grove with machine gun and canister fire, as well as rolling over the bodies, both alive and dead, of any Japanese soldiers unable or unwilling to get out of the way. That fall, the battalion moved to New Guinea to begin preparations for the Cape Gloucester, New Britain operation. operation began just after dawn on December 26th with a naval barrage on the Japanese positions followed by air attacks. These attacks and an aerial smoke screen were followed by an amphibious landing of the 1st Marine Division. The Japanese defenses around Green Beach were found abandoned. The beachhead was established by 835 and all first day objectives had been secured by 10 a.m. The following day, the Marines advanced three miles west towards their objective before reaching a Japanese blocking position on the eastern side of the airfield. The Marines identified the position as Hell's Point. Nine Marines were killed and 36 were wounded, while Japanese losses amounted to at least 266 killed. During the final days of December, the Marines overran the airfield and expanded their perimeter. In the weeks that followed the capture of the airfield, U.S. troops pushed south towards Borgen Bay to extend the perimeter beyond Japanese artillery range. On the 2nd of January, there was a sharp engagement around Suicide Creek when the advancing Marines came up against a heavily entrenched defending force from the 53rd Infantry. For two days, the battalions fought what amounted to a stalemate and paid a high price in casualties for negligible gains, while engineers labored mightily to build a corduroy causeway across the coastal swamp to enable tanks to reach the scene of action. At 8 a.m. on the morning of the 4th of January, following a 15-minute artillery preparation, a solo tank commenced a gingerly negotiation of the improvised ramp. The other tanks followed their leader, and their murderous 75s made short work of the Japanese emplacements at point-blank range, while the supporting infantry disposed of the enemy who attempted flight. Perhaps the most significant tactical development to emerge was the adaptation of tanks to jungle warfare. On September 4th, the Marines shipped off from their station on Pavuvu, just north of Guadalcanal, across the Pacific to Peleliu. The U.S. Navy's underwater demolition team went in first to clear the beaches of obstacles, while Navy warships began their pre-invasion bombardment of Peleliu on September 12th. 
As the other landing craft approached the beaches, the Marines were caught in a crossfire when the Japanese opened the steel doors guarding their positions and fired artillery. Colonel Nakagawa used the rough terrain to his advantage and constructed a system of heavily fortified bunkers, caves, and underground positions, all interlocked into a honeycomb system. These changes would force the Americans into a war of attrition. The enemy's tanks and escorting infantrymen were quickly destroyed, with 1st Tank Battalion being credited with destroying over 20 Japanese armored vehicles. Bitter fighting for the battalion continued for another two weeks, and on October 2, 1944, the battalion successfully redeployed to the Russell Islands. Went to the South Pacific, Russell Islands, the island of Pohuru, which is a group in the uh, Solomon Islands. Figures training, the, uh, did a lot of combat training on the island of Guadalcanal before the last campaign of World War II for First Tank Battalion was the assault on Okinawa, codenamed Operation Iceberg. I went to Okinawa in the 12th wave, April 1st, 1945. Our tanks uh, managed to secured the two airfields, uh, Yonkong Airfield and Kadena Airfield. Marine tank battalions learned to avoid sending in unsupported armor and instead insisted on having infantry accompany the tanks all the way. As a result, no Marine tanks were lost to individual Japanese infantrymen. back off the front lines at night and go back to our, uh, what we call the tank park. Because we had a refuel, rearm on armor, and clean our guns. Next morning we go right back to the front lines to, to support the infantry. When difficulties arose in evacuating wounded under fire and bringing up reinforcements, 1st and 6th Marine Divisions resorted to using tanks as battlefield taxis. They had a network of caves and tunnels in those, in those uh, cliffs, mm -hmm. cliffs and, uh, and hills. They were, they were ready for us, that's for sure. So one morning, we heard that they dropped an atomic bomb. Not too many of us knew what the atomic bomb was all about. And then the second bomb was dropped the next day. And, and so then, boom, the Japs surrendered and uh, the war was over. And hoorah, hoorah. Oh, golly. They gave us two beers apiece. <laughs> Just two? Just two. Okay. After the surrender of Japan at the end of World War II, Korea was divided at the 38th parallel. On the 25th of June, 1950, North Korean military forces crossed the 38th parallel and attacked into South Korea. Shortly after the communist invasion of South Korea, 1st Tank Battalion was ordered to prepare for a deployment to the Far East. The first element of the battalion to sail for Korea was Company A, which left San Diego in July and arrived in the war zone on August 2, 1950. Upon arrival, it disembarked at the port of Pusan and immediately commenced operations against the enemy. Up in that area, tanks were just considered mobile artillery because it was all hill country. So we were always in an area. So if we if we had to reach uh, a firing position where they wanted us to shoot distance, 
or say like if we wanted to see something out there like 20 miles, well then we had to move the tank off onto a, a where they had a revetment and then they had to build it up so we could have the tank elevated so we could get the tour done. After the first two months of war, the South Korean Army and U.S. forces rapidly dispatched to Korea were on the point of defeat. As a result, troops withdrew to a small area behind a defensive line known as the Pusan Perimeter, a 140-mile line that included the port of Pusan. The UN troops, consisting mostly of forces from South Korea, the United States, and United Kingdom, mounted a last stand around the perimeter and fought off North Korean attacks for six weeks. The Battle of the Pusan Perimeter would be the furthest the North Koreans would advance in the war, but the Allies still needed a way to win. General Douglas MacArthur had come up with just such a plan, an ambitious amphibious landing. After neutralizing North Korean defenses on the night of September 15th, units from Red Beach opened up the causeway to Womido, allowing the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, and the supporting tanks from Green Beach to enter the battle for Incheon. The tank infantry teams continued fighting up to the Kimpo airfield and, after defeating the defending and counterattacking forces, had it secured by the following day. The Battle of Incheon resulted in a decisive victory and changed the tide of the war. In contrast to the quick victory at Incheon, the advance on Seoul was slow and bloody. At 7 a.m. on September 25th, 1st Marines had to initiate the attack without tank support since Captain Bruce Williams' Baker Company from the 1st Tank Battalion had been delayed by fighting en route. As the head of the column approached Hill 105, the enemy opened up with small arms fire from a company-sized pocket of resistance. After the initial engagement, Captain Williams decided to send a flamethrower tank escorted by an M26 Pershing around the enemy's left flank. The flame tank moved into a position and seared the length of the enemy trenches with bursts of napalm. When the terrified enemy fled down the slope, they became targets for the tank's machine guns. The tanks took the lead, joining 3rd Battalion, 1st Marine Regiment in its fighting advance up both sides of the North-South Boulevard. The Marines pressed forward methodically, and by evening, the 3rd Battalion had penetrated about 2,000 yards into the city. In the Battle of Downtown Seoul, the Pershings of Lieutenant Colonel Harry Milne's 1st Tank Battalion provided the crucial edge, time and time again crashing through the North Korean barricades despite intense fire from the enemy's ubiquitous 45mm anti-tank guns. The battalion's war diary for September reported the destruction of 13 enemy tanks and 56 anti-tank guns. To Incheon, Seoul, went north a little ways, come back, I was hauling ammo or gasoline for the tanks. We got sacked one night. <laughs> and it's another funny story. Night is blacker than a pitch. Two o'clock in the morning, the assistant driver hops in. There's a line on the ridge out there. We could hear the rounds pinging off of our tank. I start calling the shots. 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock, three of them. And he's bowed down. So they were just spraying the area and uh, we did that for about half hour. The next morning, everybody gets out and looks around. S3 was there with us. They counted about 17 dead and 
evidence were more or more been drug away. By mid-October 1950, the Korean War appeared to be all but over. First Marine Division continued to attack north and halted at a critical road junction on the south end of the Chosen Reservoir. On the night of the 27th of November, Chinese forces of the 9th Army launched multiple attacks and ambushes along the road between the Chosen Reservoir and Coterie. Colonel Puller assembled three units together into a task force and gave command to Lieutenant Colonel Douglas Drysdale of the Royal Marines with orders to fight his way from Kotori to Haguri the next day. There was a valley about a mile long, high ground on one side and the Changjin River and more hills on the other. Drysdale would name it Hellfire Valley. It became the scene of an all-night fight. The column broke in half. And they had almost 10,000 Chinese, both sides of the road Chinese, trying to stop us. And they did a good job of it. About three or four o'clock in the morning, the senior officer by that time was a John McLaughlin, John T. McLaughlin. So the major talks to the Chinese and they, he offered to accept their surrender. <laughs> a real big joke. Drysdale had continued his start and stop progress with Company D's tanks, Company G, and the larger part of 41 Commando, not knowing what had happened to the rear half of his column. Colonel Litzenberg had about 2,200 men about half his original strength for the breakout to Koto Ri. His attack order put Lockwood's 2nd Battalion with tanks on the main road as the advanced guard. At 6.30, tanks from Company D, 1st Tank Battalion, led Lockwood's shrunken battalion out of the perimeter through the south roadblock. Almost immediately, it ran into trouble from Chinese on the left side of the road. The morning fog burned off and air support was called in. Lockwood's two rifle companies, Fox Company and Easy Company, pushed through and the advance resumed at noon. At 2 p.m., General Smith received a reassuring message from Litzenberg that the march south was going well. At 8 a.m. on the 8th of December, the 1st Marine Division continued attacking south from Koto Ri towards Hung Nam. The division arrived in Hung Nam on December 11th and 1st Tank Battalion settled into the LST staging area just before midnight. The battalion continued to support combat operations on the peninsula until the armistice was signed in 1953 and redeployed to Camp Pendleton in 1955. The expansion of the American involvement in the war in Vietnam in early 1965 was the determining factor in the next deployment of the battalion to the Far East. By May of 1966, all of the battalion's components were in Vietnam. And we had people coming back, and they would tell us what was going on over there, and the war had just started, and for tanks anyway. And, and then, uh, then when I got over there, it was uh, Pretty, pretty tough environment. Upon entry into the war-torn country, the battalion was directed to support 1st Marine Division units in operations against Viet Cong and North Vietnamese forces. A tank platoon was sent two tanks out with this battalion and two tanks out with this battalion, and, and, and they would support each other. I don't think we had a bad infantry unit because we were attached to them, we belonged to them, and we traveled with them, and they supported us every way they could. And I had nothing but great admiration for the Marine Corps infantry people, because they would protect the tanks. And... In late 1967, the People's Army of Vietnam, also known as the PAVN, 
lured American forces into the hinterlands, where the U.S. fought a series of battles known as the Hill Fights. My, uh, my first time out, I had one of my seasoned tank commanders was T.J. Siva. His tank got hit with an RPG, and that RPG went through all of it. Killed the gunner, wounded T.J. and the loader and the driver, all of them got shrapnel from it. Tank burn up. They were just lucky that they all got out of it, except the gunner. It went, and I was in the tank behind him, and the, and as soon as that guy shot, the infantry killed him. But they didn't. He jumped up real quick, and and it was just that fast. We got hit by 175 millimeter artillery, and I had myself and my lieutenant and four of my tank crewmen were killed. That was my toughest day. And I uh, had uh, five or six wounded. We were, we were cleaning the gun tubes and outside the tanks, and that hit right on us, right there. They had that, we was, that little hill called Conti Inn. These actions were part of a diversionary strategy meant to draw U.S. forces towards the Central Highlands. The Tet Offensive began on the 13th of January, 1968. Over 85,000 enemy troops simultaneously attacked over 100 South Vietnamese cities, military installations, government buildings, offices, including the U.S. Embassy. U.S. and South Vietnamese forces were initially shocked by the scale, intensity, and deliberative planning of the urban offensive. Most cities were recaptured within weeks. In the early morning hours of the 31st of January, 1968, a division-sized force of enemy soldiers launched a coordinated attack on the city of Hue. The Marines were tasked with retaking the city. The close quarter combat and the low-lying cloud cover prevented the Marine Infantry Battalions from depending upon air or artillery. Fixed-wing close air support was out of the question. Gravel remembered, the going was slow. We would go maybe a block. We fought for two days over one building. Although both battalions encountered moderate to heavy enemy resistance on the 5th, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines made somewhat faster progress. At 4.30 p.m. that afternoon, Company G, supported by M48 Patton main battle tanks, the Antos, and 3.5-inch rockets, secured the main hospital after a 90-minute firefight. One tank sustained more than 120 hits, and another went through five or six crews. Cheatham said that when the tankers come out of those tanks, they look like they were punch drunk. As planned, on the morning of the 13th of February, 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, commanded by Major Thompson, moved out of the compound. Within 15 minutes, all hell broke loose. Company A was up to their armpits in NVA. Squad and platoon-sized enemy elements were in the bunkers and built up areas along the Citadel walls. Company A took 35 casualties, including the company commander. With two attached tanks, Company C advanced approximately 300 meters before being stopped by heavy enemy fire from an archway tower along the Citadel's eastern wall. The battalion was stopped 75 meters short of its original proposed line of departure. Fighting in the Citadel was unlike anything I had ever experienced, Thompson recalled. We were in such close quarters with the enemy, often just meters away. We had no room to fire and maneuver. In essence, the fighting was an exercise of reducing fortified positions. There was slow, misty, cold rain falling constantly. I don't recall seeing the sun during that period and the cloud cover only broke enough to allow close air support on about three brief occasions. One rifleman stated that if it had not been for the tanks, we could not have pushed through that section of the city.
the Marines recaptured the city and concluded the operation on March 2, 1968. The 1st Tank Battalion remained an active combat force in Vietnam until March 1970 when it redeployed to Camp Pendleton. In August 1990, Iraqi military forces invaded the neighboring nation of Kuwait. Iraq declared that Kuwait was now a province of Iraq, thus eliminating its debt and adding Kuwait's extensive oil fields to its own. Iraq's leader, Saddam Hussein, stationed conscript infantry divisions in Kuwait and began building extensive defenses along the Kuwaiti-Saudi border. While Hussein calculated the military balance between Iraq and Kuwait correctly, he underestimated the willingness of the world community, especially the United States and Great Britain, to intervene on Kuwait's behalf. We were scheduled to go out to the, the desert, the Mojave Desert. We were scheduled to go out there to uh, Fort Irwin and we were supposed to take on the army. The army had a big force on force thing they would do out there. And then Saddam invaded Kuwait and we ended up deploying to the desert, but it was a different desert. We ended up going to fight an actual enemy over in the, uh, over in the Gulf. There were these number of avenues of approach that the Iraqis would use if they were gonna invade down into, down into Saudi Arabia. We were on the one that was closest to the Persian Gulf, closest to the water. We were just a few miles from the water. There was a main access line that would come, main highway that would come down there, and we defended that for Task Force Papa Bear. It was a really, really good defense. We had every thousand meters, we had a platoon's worth of tank holes dug, and these were amazing tank holes. When you pulled into the back part, you were all the way down. The whole tank was underneath the ground. You couldn't see it. If you were advancing on it, you couldn't see it at all. Then you pulled up to the next step, and the next step, put you, the tank commander, just above the, just above the ground line where you could, you could look with your binos, you could find targets, things like that. But the enemy, all they're going to see is looked like, would look like half a person sitting up out of the desert floor. And then it, once you acquired your targets and you pulled up onto the final step, the firing steps, so there were three steps in these platforms. We had a uh, comm wire dug between all the holes, so once you pulled in, you could wire into the company hot loop. And every thousand meters we had these things. So the, the plan was if the Iraqis invaded into Saudi Arabia, we would put our three platoons each a thousand meters apart. The lead platoon would engage, engage, engage until they got the order to retrograde. They would jump out on that highway and the next platoon would pull up onto their firing steps and engage. And then these, were, these holes were dug every thousand meters for miles and you would just retrograde back and the whole while they're having on-call artillery, everything else. It'd have been a rough road for them had they done the invasion into Saudi Arabia, at least where, where I was at, they would have had a tough go of it, <laughs> a very tough, tough fight. And then as time went on, we started to realize, well, we were actually going to invade, not invade, we were gonna repel them from Kuwait, but we were gonna go offensive. We weren't just gonna defend Saudi. We were gonna go offensive into Kuwait to repel the Iraqis. And that's when things like the mine plows started showing up and things like that. And uh, company I was in, Bravo Company, we were the breaching element because the Iraqis had two minefields that they defended, that they ran all the way across the whole, the whole border. And so our company became the breaching, the breaching company for, what was it, for Task Force Papa Bear, for I guess that's probably about half the 1st Marine Division. And uh, so every tank had either a mine plow, a mine roller, or a bulldozer on it, a blade. It was really cool, you know, because we were right up on the border, we, and the first Iraqi defense was seven miles inside of Kuwait. They didn't, they didn't put their defense right up on the Kuwait-Saudi border. They were seven miles in, so we were right on the border on the Saudi side. There's a big berm there, and we, we slept for the night there, and we were going to kick off the assault in the morning. And uh, I remember sleep. I used, we didn't set up nets that night, which was really nice because that's all we did was set up nets back there. Every time we stopped, we put a net up over the tank. We didn't set up nets, and I slept up on the net bag, and I just slept really good. And the next day, we took off, and we're, we're going into, we're going into, uh, into Kuwait, and we got stopped. We did the first breach. The first breach, they didn't defend. The first minefield belt, they didn't defend. So it was good. We got to practice one without anybody shooting at us. They, they stopped. They called the whole the whole company to all, and we were leading the whole, the whole task force. So it was pretty neat. We were traveling in a wedge. 
So, and I was in the lead platoon, so we were like an arrow, and then behind us, you had two comms and Amtrak. So it looked like a big spear from the sky, I guess. You had two comms and Amtrak, and at the front, an arrow of tanks. And you could see the Amtraks all the way back to the horizon. It was just, it was amazing how much stuff we had. And they called it to a halt, and they called for tank commanders up. So I went to my platoon commander, Lieutenant Chisholm. He was, he was doing a little huddle on the deck behind his tank. And, he's, and he drew it on the deck, and it, I, oh, it was so cool. He drew the minefield, and he says, okay, they're supported by three companies that dug in infantry, entrenched infantry. They've got a platoon of tanks. They've got a company of mortars, and they've got a, they're supported by self-propelled 122 artillery. And I remember looking at that, and I, I saw that platoon of dug in tanks. And I was on an M60 tank, which you had five tanks per platoon. And when he said platoon, I'm thinking five tanks dug in. My, you know, my heart started beating. I was thinking, ooh, because if I'm dug in against a company assaulting and they got to get through a minefield to get to me, I'm gonna be knocking out tanks till I'm out of ammo. You know, what I mean, this is this is a good situation for them. Bad for us. And I remember that really, really kind of, kind of, you know, guy got going in my head. And so when we went over the rise, it was. It was the coolest thing, and when I think about it now, I can still picture it plain as day, because it's one of the coolest things I've ever seen. It was like if you told me to make a mental picture of a battlefield, I would have pictured just what I saw right there. There was a minefield, you could see it plain as day, marked out, and it went all the way to the horizon in both directions. There were zigzag trench lines, just like we had trained to fight. They, were these, they, would, they would do them in zigzags, and they called it a triangle defense, with two, two companies up front, one company in the back with these zigzag trench lines and you could see them. You could see the bunkers all intermixed in them. The, the three tanks were already gone. The uh, air Cobra helicopters had smoked them with Hellfire missiles. They, they were already on fire. So that, <laughs> that made my heart a lot better. And, uh, and you see just people everywhere, stuff on fire everywhere, enemy everywhere, they're running. I was like, wow, this is an actual battlefield. This is what it actually looks like. And our company commander, Captain Robeson was his name. Captain Robeson comes on the company tack and he says, all right, Bravo, let's start knocking out some of these targets. So I said, fire, I, just, I want to have the first round of the company, you know? So I already had range, I had everything. And as soon as Captain Robeson said, let's start knocking out some of these targets, I said, fire, boom, he squeezed it off. Obscuration comes up in front of the turret, so we can't see nothing. We just see the brown sand of the dust. And then we bust out of that obscuration and the bunker had the top, the back blown off of it. There was crap everywhere. There was, you know, everything that was in the bunker was, was out. The, the crew's all over the place. And uh, I can hear my driver. My driver's he's just oorah down there in the driver's compartment. It, it was that first round. Once you got that first round out, then everything just felt like training from there. Everything just felt like just the way we'd always planned to do it. It was our three tanks on the other side in this trench line. And it was, uh, it was just like we'd always trained to do. So we're, we, you know, we're in there amongst these infantry, we're lighting them up with machine guns, we're firing main guns. There was a lot of point blank stuff. I, I can remember doing this, is, is just looking down my gun tube and putting it right in a bunker hole and squeezing it where the, the muzzle and the bunker are as far apart as you and I, and uh, just popping it that way. So we did a lot of that. And then eventually the infantry got on the other side and then they started working their way in there, making sure there was nobody now, which would be to our rear, Nobody's still alive in the, any of those holes or any of those trench lines behind us. When we, when we went into Kuwait International, that was another good fight. We had the toes with us. The toes had the thermal sights, so they could pick out targets for us that we couldn't see with our infrared. They were putting it on the company tack. They were holding a, a handset next to whatever they were hearing and putting it out over our company tack. And it was the President of the United States talking. And he was saying, as of such and such time, there's going to be a ceasefire uh, in cool, you know, the, he was announcing the ceasefire. And we're on like the fourth day and I was like, holy cow, we, we're just getting warmed up. You know, we're just getting started. And uh, he, they were announcing the ceasefire. And I remember thinking, wow, I mean, that was, it was, uh, it was quick. It was so quick. The ceasefire was established on the 28th of February and by April 1991, the battalion returned home to Camp Las Flores aboard Camp Pendleton, California. Take two. Take two and two, one. 
This is as close as we can get to the base of the World Trade Center. You can see the firemen assembled here, the police officers, FBI agents, and you can see the two towers. A huge explosion now raining debris on all of us. We better get out of the way! We had come in to PT that morning, and I remember the news was, they had the news in, uh, playing inside the, uh, inside the hut, and the first plane had hit the uh, Twin Towers. And we honestly thought it was something, some mechanical pilot error, or some issue such as that, that uh, we, were, we were just flabbergasted, like how does a pilot miss that? And um, we went out to PT, and when we got back, they told us that a second plane had hit, that it was a terrorist attack. Good evening. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The victims were in airplanes or in their offices, secretaries, businessmen and women, military and federal workers, moms and dads, friends and neighbors. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. The pictures of airplanes flying into buildings, fires burning, huge, huge structures collapsing, have filled us with disbelief, terrible sadness, and a quiet, unyielding anger. Operation Iraqi Freedom began on March 19, 2003, and was intended to disarm Iraq of weapons of mass destruction, end Saddam Hussein's support for terrorism, and free the Iraqi people. We were always in the field shooting, but it took on a level of intensity that I had not seen before. On top of that, we started packing gear up to see how it would fit and what we would take, and uh, gear inspections started ramping up. And then we get the word that we're going. But when we got on that plane, we were ready to go. We, we wanted to go at that point. We were, we were just, we just wanted to get it done and over with. We wanted to go do our jobs and come home. And uh, I remember climbing the airplane and looking around and knowing that it could be my last time ever in the United States. And this is where reality in movies kind of takes a huge separation. You know, you watch movies and, you know, it's here's the front of the enemy defensive line, here's the front of the friendly line, and you collide. It wasn't like that. When we came up on them, they expected us to come down the, the uh, across highway, an east-west running road, and we came at them from the south. So they were pointing the wrong direction for the most part. So we came up uh, as if we were driving, we were going to drive right across their frontage. And, man... It just, uh, they stared at us, we stared at them for a moment, and then all of a sudden, um, the lieutenant's gunner, a guy named Sergeant Hightower, he ended up getting combat uh, meritorious promotion while he was there to sergeant. He was a corporal at the time. Hightower was an MTOB, a small personnel carrier, and those things are capable of carrying uh, anti-tank guided missiles sitting off to my, it was in front of me about three, 400 meters, just slightly off to my right, and that was the extreme right of the platoon. And he cooked off a sable round uh, into that MTLB and I remember this guy had popped out of the hatch was staring at us was staring at his buddies over to his right when that sable round just came and caught him straight in the chest and the second that round hit that guy he turned to confetti and everybody started shooting all at once General Mattis sitting uh, standing on top of our tanks talking to us at uh, at TA Ripper before we cross the border. And he says, gentlemen, if you're unclear as to my intent, by the end of the first day, I want to be arrayed along the Shat al Basra, and I want the 51st Mechanized Infantry Division to cease to exist. We met commander's intent. Uh, we demolished them. When we cross the border, we don't have to make the combined arms package as difficult as they teach it on CACs and 29 Palms with the Coyotes. And I thought that was healthy because most guys have it so burned in on how they're doing this, this 
this varsity level deconfliction of aviation, fire support, direct fire weapon systems, the maneuver that's associated with that. We literally, some I didn't bring it up, somebody else brought it up and said, remember, if you can do it simpler, you know the simple way. Don't, you don't have to do it the hard way. Just remember you don't have to do it the hard way. I'm like, yeah, I'm tired, but that, thanks for saying that because that, that's just a good reminder. When the engineer lieutenant told us, hey, this Miklik's a dud, I gotta send a guy out. I said, all right, we're gonna do this, and we literally did it on a countdown. Uh, Lieutenant Ufford's tank, uh, platoon had six tanks instead of four because we had extra mine plows and breaching capability. So he was spread three and three on both sides overwatching this minefield, and I just said, we're gonna lay every machine gun we have on all of these vehicles. We're putting down a wall of suppression pick sectors, and I, I'd st and the, the two lieutenants coordinated, Alfred and, and the engineer lieutenant, Paul Bach. And literally, okay, on the count of three. One, two, three, and they start just sending coax and 50 cal respective directions, and the Lance Corporal runs right down the gauntlet that's being surrounded by machine gun fire, places this, blows it, gets back in, and ran so fast with so much adrenaline he thought it was, that it didn't go off and it was just that he had like three more seconds to wait and then the C4 blew it up. That was the final piece and opened that minefield. The initial phase of the operation formally ended on May 1st, 2003 and 1st Tank Battalion redeployed to 29 Palms. The battalion deployed back to Iraq in 2004 and fought in the first Battle of Fallujah in April 2004. At the time, we were running out of ammo. Uh, we shot, I shot more main gun ammunition in Fallujah than I fired in the entire invasion. And uh, we were running low on ammo, big time. And I remember just like arraying these pretty little six warheads, the six rounds inside the ready rack going, that's all I got, that's it. I got six, six main gun rounds. I've got a couple thousand rounds of 7.62. I've got a few hundred rounds of 50 cal. This is all I got to go fight in the city which fighting in the city meant you, you were fighting together in separate efforts. We would have every weapon system engaged at any point in time, loader shooting in one direction, my 50 cal going off in another direction, the gunner shooting in another direction, the driver calling out shots for everybody. There was, was something we used to call a hedgehog formation. So we put two tanks up in the front, right? Now I was the two tanks, so I was the front front. Uh, I'd have, I'd have uh, cat vehicles out in front of me and then behind me, I would have a, a platoon of infantry and then the other two tanks and then the remainder of the infantry company behind them. We had been, um, we had been uh, farmed out to Suicide Charlie 17. Let me tell you something, when you get told you're gonna get farmed out to Suicide Charlie 17, like Suicide Charlie, this should prove to be an interesting next few days. And these guys were great, they were phenomenal. Um, Explosive reaction was the way to go. So we would drive down the road at a good clip. Um, cat vehicles, because they were, they would come down and kind of drop markers along the way so we knew which route to take. Because they were, we gave them enough space between us and them that they could back up if they had to, ran into something bigger than what they were ready to contend with. And it would give us, we were, but we were close enough that we could sprint up ahead. And as we closed in on them, you'd hear a couple shots fired, nothing much, and quiet. And we kept pushing, 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 pushing. And we cleared several compounds, uh, Republican Guard compounds, several little villages on the way up. And then we got arrayed right along the uh, bridges that went into, uh, went into Baghdad. And we were just sitting right outside of Baghdad. The battalion supported counterinsurgency operations in Iraq until 2008. Operation Enduring Freedom began on October 7, 2001 in response to the September 11th terrorist attacks. 1st Tank Battalion began deploying companies to Afghanistan in 2010 and fought in and around Marja, Sanjin, Muskala, Nauzad, and Garmsur. The last tank company, Company D, deployed to Helmand Province in 2013. But the Taliban had a pretty strong hold uh, on the area and, uh, and we need to kind of help go in and provide security for the retrograde of this, this, uh, for this combat outpost. 
We're going through all the planning. Uh, the MARSOC team leader happened to be a friend of mine from Paris Island. Uh, and we're kind of getting all their intel briefs about, hey, the Taliban in this area are not going to care that you show up with, with a, a company worth of tanks. My Iraq experience was that's what everybody says until a company worth of tanks shows up and then everybody wants to be friends. We kick off Operation Dynamic Partner for about the first 36 hours. Everything that I had expected was starting to come true. It's, you know, shaking hands and kissing babies and everything is going swimmingly well and there's not a Taliban fighter within, you know, within eyesight of anything. Uh, but that all changed on the second day when everything that the MARSOC team had said was going to come true came true. Uh, and for about the next five to six days, um, the Taliban attacked pretty relentlessly two or three times a day. Uh, you know, the attacks would last from anywhere from 15, 20 minutes to an hour and a half, two hours. Um, and we had 10 tanks a part of this operation. Uh, there was an entire motorized rifle company. Uh, obviously all the close air support and HIMARS and everything else you could possibly imagine coming with a, uh, a fight in 2013 in Afghanistan. Still required uh, about 129 tank main gun rounds over the course of the five days. You know, 20,000 7.62 rounds uh, and, and a couple thousand 50 cal rounds, which had been really a lot of the tank company's experiences in Afghanistan. And so it was a, it was a great way to kind of come in and, and cut our teeth. We were super successful. The Marines fought hard. Uh, I think my proudest fact of that, um, of that operation was in all that ordinance that was fired from the tank company, not a single person died that didn't deserve to die. Uh, we had zero civilian casualties, um, you know, zero unknown casualties. Every, every single person we killed uh, was a Taliban fighter uh, and, and it's a tribute not only to the capabilities of the M1 uh, but, but to the, the professionalism and discipline of the 1802s and 1812s that were on that operation that day. And, and then obviously all the, the supporting, you know, the 2146s that kept us going uh, and the rest of the guys in the trains that, you know, made sure we had all the things we needed to stay up in the fight. Operation Enduring Freedom ended on December 28th 2014. But the word I would use to describe a tanker is, is a Marine. We do what's required of us. We don't require a lot of fanfare uh, and we get the job done. Uh, and I think you could go back the you know, hundred and some odd years of the tank, the tank community's history. Uh, you know, we're sitting in this beautiful museum with with you know, the Pershing behind us, but you know, going back to World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, Somalia, I mean, all the places that tankers have been uh, in support of, of our brothers and sisters, uh, Marines, we've accomplished the mission time and time again. What I love about being a Marine and being a tanker is the individuals that you can always count on. And there is something about the brotherhood we have in our community um, that people will step up. They're not seeking heroics. They're not seeking anything other than I'm a part of the team and this is my thing to do. Um, and they do it. And as a leader, just, just being able to watch that sort of excellence of performance is, it's been the, be the best part of a career. Oh, that tanks is it. That's the way to go, man. You, you, you got it. You got it. You got a good crew. Oh, man. You can move, shoot, and communicate. Just surrounded by so many good people, I, I, just a great group of guys with us. Yeah, just privileged to be there, privileged to be amongst the guys I got to go with.